Uh, good morning, Hartford. How's everyone doing? Oh, come on. Not enough coffee? Uh, as Aaron said, uh, I'm Paul Reed. This is Failure as Success, so let's launch into it. So I want to do a quick survey. It helps me understand the audience a little better. So how many people would describe themselves? This is the standard DevOps days question. How many people describe themselves as developers? OK, how many people would describe themselves as operations? It's all the operations people are down on, on the bottom row. What's that about? Um, and how many people describe themselves as other? I'm, I, I'm actually an other as well. Uh, cool. All right, about uh, roughly equal of those groups. Cool. And then uh, for this part, I actually want you to keep your hands up. So how many people uh, are responsible for running an incident retrospective or postmortem, wherever they work? OK, keep your hands up. How many people go to those incident retrospectives or postmortems? OK, how many people read the postmortem reports because they just want to know why the website went down and don't want it to happen again? OK, that's basically everyone, which is good, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we have, uh, before we launch into things, uh, we have a couple of quick house cleaning things to do. You're going to need a piece of, peep, uh, piece of paper later, uh, as well as a writing utensil. Now, Jose is somewhere right there. If you do not have paper or a, a writing utensil, he will be passing them out. You're not going to need it right now, but you're going to need it later. So um, if you don't have uh, those available, uh, ask Jose. He will bring one to you. Second thing is uh, we thought it would be fun this morning. You need to get a buddy for this talk, which is going to be fun. So I want you to pair up teams of two or three. No more than three. Introduce yourself to whoever you're sitting next to. Say hi. Go ahead. Self-organize here. And as you are saying hi, the other thing that you will need to do is split into, you need to have an A person and a B person. If you have a team of three, you can have two A people or B people, doesn't matter. Uh, but you're going to uh, need to have an A person and a B person. Okay, are we all grouped up? Okay, let's come back up front. All right, so what we're going to start with is uh, a bit of a thought experiment. Now, one of the first presentations I ever did on DevOps uh, was called, Is Your Team Instrument Rated? And there's a link up there if you're curious about it. But it was basically asking the question, uh, if we look at other operational endeavors that humanity is involved with, uh, in this case, it was the national airspace system, what could we learn from them? So the thesis was, well, if we think of developers as, as pilots and operations people as air traffic controllers, and then we looked at, at aviation and the national airspace system, what patterns might, might be applicable to our lives? Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. Uh, again, you can see the talk if you want to. Um, but the thought experiment we're going to run uh, is an actual back and forth exchange between a pilot and controller at JFK, just down the road a little bit. Um, and I want to tell you right now, I'm going to ask you questions about this later. So let's see, let's see what happens here. American 2 Eddie Kenny Town, only 2 2 up, you're number 2 for the field. Traffic's on a 4 mile final of 3 1 right. Wind is 3 2 0 at 2 2. Clear to land, only 2 2 up. At 2 2 left, American 2 Eddie. Very digital for 2 2 left. American 2 Eddie, 2 2 left, you clear to land. Clear to land. 2 2 left. Your, your localizer is not an orange. Okay, I will double check it. American 2 Eddie, I just reset it. Should be coming back up in a little while. Wind now 32023, gust into 35. We get 2 2. Uh, we can't land on uh, 2 2. Uh, we're breaking off approach, and if you don't give us 2 uh, runway uh, 3 1 right, we're going to declare emergency. All right, I'll pass it along. Fly runway heading for now. Okay, we're declaring emergency. We're going to land 3 1 right. We're going to go left and then we're coming around. Hurricane 2 Abby, just fly runway heading. 
or the area. Okay, you saying you declare an emergency at this? Three times I've told you that. Three times we're declaring an emergency. Okay, I just want to verify. I know you told me if you didn't get 31 right, you would have to declare emergency. Okay, understand. Fly when we head in. Right. I got to get your turn. No, we can't. JetBlue 62, the left on Alpha and monitor ground to the ramp. That's Alpha, monitor the ground, JetBlue 62. I head in 180. You know what? American 2 Heavy, uh, we are turning around to the left here and landing on 3 1. Remove everybody from our way. We've declared an emergency. Okay. So that sounds pretty stressful. Um, I've given this presentation, you know, not in this, not an you know, area near JFK, and people are like, I don't want to fly home to JFK anymore. <laughs> so that's that's fun if you're flying out of JFK, you know. So I have a question for you: Was this event a success or a failure? Did anybody die? Did anybody die? That's an interesting question. We're going to talk about that. But you might think about it. Maybe, maybe write down uh, on the paper you hopefully have now. Uh, whether or not you think it was a success or a failure, or, or if there was a percentage, it was 20% successful or 80%. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, what is success? Is success just the absence of failure, or is it actually something else? Is it more complicated than that? So uh, this is the uh, obligatory about me slide. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, I'll point out two things. Uh, I am uh, J. Paul Reed on Twitter, so if I say something that is confusing, feel free to tweet at me. Uh, we can discuss it on Twitter. Um, the other thing I want to point out is, uh, actually, I used to be a Master of Science candidate. Uh, I, I finished it up in Human Factors and System Safety. Thank you. Um, the reason I mention that is because we're going to be talking a lot about uh, uh, safety sciences in this presentation. So I wanted to give that kind of context for uh, how the angle that uh, I'm looking at a lot of this stuff through. The other thing that it's worth calling out is a lot of these discussions about failure are going to be impacted by uh, your own experiences with failure or your organization's sort of experience with failure. You know, if you had parents that when you fell off the horse told you to get back on the horse, uh, you're going to have a different sort of sense in dealing with failure than if your parents said maybe you should be go uh, play the clarinet, kind of like my, my parents told me. Um, and that's all going to factor into uh, how you, we think about failure and success. The other sort of interesting thing is this is uh, just a, a Google uh, results screenshot um, of all of the public postmortems uh, that Chef has held for their marketplace. And what's interesting about that is, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about failure in the industry right now. Um, you might ask yourself, they hold their postmortems on a, on a YouTube uh, or a Google Hangout, and then they post them later, and anybody can join. So for those of you that run postmortems, you might think to yourself, what would it be like to have like that uh, in a Google Hangout that anybody could watch? It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, people may have heard, uh, heard of this blameless, sort of blameless postmortem thing. This is a slide from my hand, uh, friend, Jason Hand. He, he lives in Colorado, um, you know, the Mile High State. Um, so if you look at that photo, I'm like, maybe that's what everybody's just, you know, uh, happy about it. Um, the other thing is there's, I, I, these are various articles about this sort of idea in tech, in the tech industry, this, this sort of... Uh, fetishizing of failure, the failure fetish, or, or you know, the, 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 uh, the problem with the entrepreneurship's failure fetish. I like this photo, by the way, because it, I, I can't tell if he's just like playing a developer as plaintiff, or if he's thinking about like, I'm paying $5,000 for a studio apartment in San Francisco. Uh, anyway, but uh, so today, though, we're going to be looking at this idea of failure and success. And we're going to be talking about uh, what you would go through uh, if you, the mindset of shifting this idea of failure to, to that being a success, the methods, those are the things that you would have to do to do that, and then some of the landmines. These are problems that occur uh, when people try to do this. So let's start out with the mindset. So you're going to see all of these words. Uh, in any of these conversations, you're going to be talking a lot about these words, accident, blame, human error is a good one. Uh, incidents, failure, and really, uh, again, we're talking about uh, safety here. Um, a lot of these ideas, again, come from the safety science uh, and, and these uh, safety sciences, and these, these ideas have been studied for about the past 80 years or so. Now, a lot of you, a lot of it comes, a lot of that, that area of study comes from industrial accidents, and you might say to yourself, well, that's cool. Uh, what does safety have to do with anything that we do in tech? 
Um, and I have a question um, that used to be actually somebody giggled and I was thinking about like autonomous vehicles are kind of a safety critical thing, but you're like, maybe we don't do those. Um, who here has heard of Knight Capital? I see a couple of hands, cool. All right, well, Knight Capital was a high frequency trading firm uh, in New York and uh, they did a deployment uh, on a Wednesday. And then the, uh, they deployed to all of their servers and then Thursday morning, 9 a.m., they opened up for, for trading and uh, they found out, huh, something's not going quite right. And it turns out that they lost about $140,000 a second for 45 minutes. Sorry, $170,000 a second. At the end of that 45 minute window, they were down $460 million. That's Thursday. Turns out on Friday when all those orders need to be paid for, they don't have $460 million in the bank and they are out of business. So the point here is that when we work in these big, uh, complicated, complex systems, it really is from a safety perspective, a situation where you can do a deployment on a Wednesday, have a bad Thursday, and potentially be out of business on a Friday. These systems move that quickly. Now you might say, hey, high frequency trading, we're not doing that, so that's cool. We don't have to worry about that. Um, has anybody heard of this, the, the uh, pet net feeder? So these are these little uh, pet feeders that you can get and they connect to Wi-Fi and then they have a little smartphone app and then you can feed Fluffy or Fifi, you know, at work or whatever, or on vacation. And what I find really interesting about this is uh, they had a problem, some minor difficulties with a third party server. I don't know if they're referring to cloud or a server in someone's garage or what's going on, but um, they had a problem and they were starving people's pets, right? Um, so, What's interesting here is that we all have these systems that may have dependencies that we're not entirely clear about what all the actual dependencies are. So it turns out that maybe we all might be working in this world, whether or not we know it. So this is the only really super academic part of the talk, uh, and, and it's just to give you some historical context about the journey, and then I'm gonna apply it to tech, and I, I promise we'll go through this pretty quickly, but I want, I want everyone to understand sort of the thinking and how it's progressed. So our original idea of safety was this idea that uh, we've got energy and we have to constrain it, we have to control this energy. And so the way you would do that is with a barrier. So the original thinking was sort of post-World War II, we've got a factory, or we've got a chemical plant, uh, something like that. And uh, failure is, you know, a uh, uh, pipe explodes or, you know, a machine, you know, has a problem or something like that. So failure is this release of energy. And of course, if you want to be safer, you can design safety into these systems, right? You can, you can make, look, you can do an analysis of the factory floor and see all of the things and then decide, okay, would we move machines around? You can design these things to be safer, right? And of course, if you want to be safer, what do you do? Well, you add more barriers to that system, right? You make the walls of the tank thicker or the pipe thicker or something like that. Um, so this worked relatively well uh, up into the, the first, you know, post-World War II, World War I, World War II era, uh, eras when they were looking at this stuff. But then something in the late 70s changed all of this, all of the thinking about this. Any guesses as to what that was? Hmm? Yep. There's actually three that really changed. It was Three Mile Island, Challenger, and Chernobyl were the big accidents that made everyone go, this is not really working. Now, there's a couple of really interesting things about the investigation that was done when they started looking into what happened. And what they realized is there were sort of two issues that, that were really the cause of a lot of uh, frustration and problems when they were trying to deal with these situations, specifically with Three Mile Island. So if you know anything about nuclear power in the United States, what they basically did is they took submarine reactors and they made them really big, and then they bolted a generator onto the side of them, and that's our, that's our electrical plants. Um, so we're scaling these systems uh, really big, and what they found is there's these emergent properties, these emergent behavior that you can't just design for even as you're scaling these systems, right? So that was problem number one. Problem number two is in a lot of these systems, you don't have direct observability. So in a reactor, you can't go down and take the temperature core of the core because you would die. So there's a bunch of systems in place to do that. But then the question is, well, okay, what if one monitor says one thing and another monitor says another thing? Which one's right? And this is, of course, one of, was one of the core problems of Three Mile Island. There's also a really interesting story about um, 
you remember those old line dot matrix printers, right? So there's a computer, and it had a printer attached to it, and it would print out, and that was the log of the plan of what was going on. And uh, the, the uh, accident started, and after about nine hours, they turned the printer off because it, was, it had been printing for nine hours. They rebooted the computer. When they went and looked at the log files that it had gotten through, it had gotten through the first four minutes of the accident. So that's the other thing, is that these accidents are so quickly moving that a lot of the ways that we might think about how we design safety in just aren't able to cope with them. So because of this, a guy named Charles Perrow, who's a sociologist, came up with this different theory. And he said, all right, well, in his model, systems are either very linear or very complex. So that's one axis. The other one is how, how tightly coupled are the components. So are they really tightly coupled, or are they more loosely coupled components? So if you kind of perturb one part of the system, will that perturbation go all the way through, or will it sort of be absorbed by the system? So those are the two axes. And he said certain systems, the complex, tightly coupled ones, will have accidents. And also, you can't do anything about it. This is normal. It's just the way it is. Sorry. It's totally unavoidable. This is uh, the graph out of, uh, or the kind of diagram out of his book. So you've got loose on the bottom here, tightly coupled up top, linear on one side, complex on the other side. The examples that he picks are actually kind of interesting. Like uh, junior college in, is in here, and universities are over here, kind of. A, um, now, one thing that you might look at this and think to yourself, where would, what quadrant, quadrant would you put your system in? It's an interesting uh, kind of thing to think about. But Perro was mostly uh, concerned with nuclear power, nuclear weapons accidents, nuclear power. So that's the upper, up into the right, upper right-hand corner of this. Um, and that's where he was really focused. So again, tightly coupled, very complex. So there was a group, though. So that theory kind of made it a lot of sense. It was a very compelling theory. But a group of people at Berkeley actually looked. And they were like, well, there's, there's a lot of systems that are tightly coupled and complex, and they're not experiencing accidents at the rate that we would expect to see them if this whole normal accident theory is correct. So they studied a bunch of different areas. The coolest one was the deck of aircraft carriers. So I'm going to talk about them because it's, it's cool. Um, and what they found uh, as a property of all these various systems is constant active learning. So they valued that you have to keep learning as you're working in the system. You're always learning new things as, as part of, your, of the work that you're doing. Um, the way they facilitated this on the aircraft carrier is they did crew rotation. So there's a great quote from one of the, the uh, uh, people on the, the top of the ship, and, and he was saying, uh, you know, as soon as I, I feel like I know my job, I'm already on to the next position and the next kind of training role that I'm, I'm learning how to do, um, which was kind of interesting. Decentralized active review. So this is the idea that if we're in a system, we're working together, I can kind of look at the people around me, and I have a sense of of what they're doing because I've done it, right? I've rotated through those positions. And this becomes really important because if I see something that looks kind of out of place, like, oh, you forgot to reset the hook for the plane or whatever it is, right? I can actually have that conversation with that person and say, hey, what's going on there? Uh, and, and that helps keep the system safe, even in these, these high tempo complex environments. Uh, rank is de-emphasized sort of oddly, right? Because we think it's the military. So the lowest ranked person on the, the uh, deck of the ship can say, hey, we're, we're uh, not going to land planes anymore because of a situation. And that would be OK. They would stop landing planes and figure that out. And finally, success may be failure. And this is probably the most important idea here. It's the idea that uh, you could have a landing. The, the plane could you know, taxi to its parking spot. The pilot could get out. And everyone in that system was not comfortable with that landing. But if you're looking at it from maybe the captain or the admiral, you know, we, we didn't bend a plane, we didn't bend a ship, and we didn't bend a pilot, so that's a success, right? But if you talk to the people that actually did it, they're like, no, 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 we got way too close to the edge there. So those were the sort of things that they found in this idea of high reliability organizations. That's what they called them. All right, so quick review here. Idea of energy and barriers, normal accidents high to high reliability orgs. So this idea, the, the progression that we see is static processes and repeated defenses to this more idea of active defenses and active processes that are sort of keeping us safe, right? Um, technical engineer, engineering solutions, so we can design safety in, moves more to solutions inherent to the people, the organization, probably most importantly, the way that we do our work. There's something about the way that we do our work that makes us more or less, quote unquote, safe. 
So if you look at technology, and I promise I bring it back to our industry, who's been responsible for the uh, DR site? Making sure the backups work. Yeah, um, that's always been a, a, fun, a fun task. I, I got tasked with that for a few years early, my, early in my career. We saw the shift from that to sort of this idea if, if anybody's done any COM or CORBA programming, right? We could have these components that are really, these software components that are really well tested. And then if we put them together, together like Legos, it'll, everything will work perfectly, right? Yeah, somebody laughed because they got that joke. Microservices, right? There's going to be talks here about microservices. A lot of people think uh, you know, that they're the solution to everything. But they do solve a problem. And it's this idea that if we can make our systems more decoupled and maybe make the logic of a particular part of that system, the service, more not as complex, that there's a benefit to that. And, and you know, they're not wrong. Uh, and finally, we see now organizations doing drilled incident response, retrospectives, red teaming, and this idea of value streams. One of the interesting things, uh, does people know what red teaming is here? No? OK. Red teaming is where you hire people to hack you, and you pay people on staff to hack you. And I've interviewed a couple of security teams at various companies uh, in Silicon Valley that hire these teams. And some of the stories they tell are actually super amazing uh, and also hilarious. Um, they involve, like, the company has to, like, immunize them from prosecution because they're basically breaking the law right and left. Uh, so that's kind of cool. It's a job you can actually have now. All right, so the methods. How would you go about doing this? Well, one of the best ways to do it is injecting failure. So who here has heard of Chaos Monkey? Yeah, okay. I used to uh, ask this question, uh, and people would go, like, I don't know what Chaos Monkey is. Um, but there's been a lot of talk recently about Chaos Engineering, uh, Chaos Monkey. For those that don't know, this is Netflix's system for basically randomly injecting failure into their cloud-based instances, mostly by turning them off. What's interesting is most people notice or pay attention to the, the monkey that goes around turning instances off. There are other monkeys. In fact, let's see, there's janitor monkey, doctor monkey, conformity monkey, latency monkey, and security monkey. So there's a whole army of monkeys doing various things in their system. I think latency monkey is the most interesting. They'll actually uh, introduce latency into services to see how does that latency propagate, does it not? Like, does that work the way they expected? What you see a lot now is a uh, human chaos monkey. So what I mean by that is someone will go up to someone and they'll say, hey, you, all right, we're going to take your VPN uh, key and we're going to take your laptop away from you. It's a Thursday. Go home and have a four-day weekend. And then we're going to do a drill on Friday. Because then we're going to find out all the things that that one individual knows and the rest of the team does not know. Um, the other one that I see that's kind of interesting, the whole team uses like Macs, or if you've got a mixed environment, so some people have Windows, some people have Macs, um, they'll take people's laptops away from them and give them a Windows laptop if they're a Mac person and say, okay, run the incident. And they do this because if you think about it, like if you're on call and your laptop is in your car and you go out and your car got towed, what are you going to do, right, to respond to that incident? Um, so. Uh, they want to see these sort of social parts, like what happens when we start introducing, introducing sort of social or people chaos into the system. Right, incident command and crews. There's a lot of talk about in incident response in the industry. Um, a lot of, uh, I think in the tech industry, we've sort of gotten the message, like we need to be more like firefighters and how they do this. So there's been a lot of work done on this. Um, a lot of organizations are getting really good at it. I will see the, the clients that I work with, what I see now is they're really good at the, like showing up to the fire, to use the analogy, and they're not so good at resetting. So the way that I explain it is like, okay, well, your house is on fire, you have an incident, the whole team gets together, so they form the crew really well, they get to the fire, they put the fire out, uh, and then it would be like everybody just takes off their gear and walks away, leaving the fire truck and the hoses and the gear all on the front lawn, right? Well, fire departments don't do that, right? They roll up the hoses, they take the fire truck back, they back the fire truck into the firehouse as opposed to going in head first so that they can respond to the next incident. We're not so good at that. We're not so good at resetting our crews after we've formed them. So that's an area of, of growth, I think, for the tech industry. Postmortems. Blameless postmortems. Um, who's heard that term, blameless postmortem? Okay, who does that for? Does that term feel weird to? Like blameless? What's that about? Don't worry, I won't blame you. Um, if it feels weird to you, you're not alone. Um, 
There's a sociologist named Brenny Brown. Uh, she talks about how blame is a way to uh, discharge pain and discomfort. And what she means by that is that we're actually hardwired to use blame as a mechanism to get rid of feelings that are just not great. And what's interesting about this is it's not just blaming other people. How many uh, retrospectives have you been to where somebody's like, it was me, I screwed up. Like, I'm blaming myself, can we all move on? Like, like I, I just messed up. And, the, and that is a way to get rid of, it's sort of a release valve to get rid of these sort of feelings of guilt or whatever it might be. So the point is, blameless is actually not a thing. I always talk about when people go into blame, blameless postmortems, it's like we're pretending, we're going into a meeting and pretending that uh, nobody has arms. And it's like, I, I can see my arms and I can see your arms, but, but we're not going to pretend we don't have arms. It's kind of odd to me. I wrote a little bit about this. If you're curious, kind of a more nuanced dissection of that argument, uh, there's a blog post you can read on that. So how do you do uh, a retro? Well, obviously, it's important to debrief the actors get what was in their head, um, figure out what they were thinking as they were doing that. So that's super important. You need to gather the data. So hopefully uh, you've got monitoring all set up uh, throughout your infrastructure and you have this data available to look at. Uh, so you can grab that together. And the point is, uh, how many people when they do retros create timelines? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, what's interesting about this is that uh, the idea here is that you actually wanna put all of this data together and that's where you can start to get a really deep understanding of what was going on in the event. It's not just, a lot of timelines I see are like time, event, time, event, right? And that, that, it's, that seems to me to be more of a record keeping function. A lot of times when they talk about timelines, it's like this where you put the graph data together with the tasks of various people. By the way, this is from uh, Sidney Decker's The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. Um, and then also in, in certain systems, I actually put what people were saying, that's on the bottom there. Um, and so then you can start to make correlations, right, where you see these vertical lines, uh, T1, T2, and those are kind of what I call capital E events. They're pivot points in your incident where something changed that was relevant and you should look at. And you can see it here where the graph gets to a plateau, right, and that coincides with what somebody just just ended doing, stopped doing, and then somebody said you see it, right? And you're only going to really get the sense of that uh, if, you, if you put all of that data together. Now, uh, what I want to do for a couple minutes, uh, by yourself, so don't talk to your partners, take that piece of paper and that pen, and I want you to create a timeline for the uh, incident that we saw at JFK earlier. So we'll just take a couple minutes and do this again on your own. And for the A people, I want you to do the incident starting at the start and going forward. For the B people, I want you to start at the last thing you remember and go backwards. All right, so a couple minutes, let's do that. do this for about another minute. All right, last 15 seconds, get those last few items on your timeline that you remember down. Okay, so put, set those aside, set your timeline aside. We'll, we'll look at it again shortly. 
So another method to make this all work is you need uh, sort of what I call retrospective ready infrastructure. So this is you know, right out of aviation, right? The idea that, that uh, you need uh, data recorders for your system and they have two, right? They have one that uh, gets all the data from the plane and they have one that records what's going on in the cockpit. And the point here is again, you wanna cover the infrastructure. So in that example, it's the plane, the engines, what were they doing, how much fuel was on board, that kind of stuff. You wanna record things about the environment. So what was the weather like? Uh, what was the airspeed and altitude, stuff like that. But you also wanna make sure you uh, capture the operational aspect. So again, that's the cockpit voice recorder. Of course, in tech, that means something different. Um, but the point here is that modern tools and architectures really account for this. This is, uh, by the way, why chat ops, if you've heard of chat ops, um, is such a big deal because a lot of, uh, you can find out just by looking at the chat log, like what happened, you, it kind of gives you your base level timeline right out of the gate. Uh, teammate is a way to actually look at a terminal with, with somebody else in, in real time. Um, it's a tool for that, so if you, you can like debug things in real time uh, with someone else. Um, and then, of course, incident response and management tools. So these are tools like VictorOps, PagerDuty, um, build, are starting to build these things into their tools. Uh, if you haven't heard of ChatOps, that's uh, Jason Hand's book on it, uh, and you can grab that for free. So let's talk a little bit about the landmines that you would run into when you try to reframe failure as success. So organizational incompatibility. Um, and this is just the idea that, that uh, there are certain organizations that it's going to be really, really hard for them to reframe failure as success for potentially many reasons. Um, it could be the, the, their history um, and, and just the way they kind of think of the world. It could be that they've had a lot of incidents recently and that's just going to be really hard for them to do. Um, there's a great book by uh, this Stanford business professor named Robert Sutton called The No Asshole Rule. Um, and it's, it, he, he did a study of a bunch of, uh, of organizations and, and uh, kind of talked about this. And it, one of the great statistics in it is uh, the total cost of asshole per year. Uh, and it turns out it's $160,000. So if you have an asshole in your organization, that's how much it costs you. Uh, by the way, by the way, he actually very narrowly defines what he means by that. Um, it's a good book. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty quick read. Um, but he asks, the best single question for testing an organization's character is, what happens when people make mistakes? Right, so one of the anti-patterns here is only certain groups get to fail. I always love this idea that uh, when developers make a mistake, it's a bug, and when operations people make a mistake, it's an incident. Like, I don't, I don't get why that difference is made. Um, but if you've got only certain people that it's organizationally okay to fail, like, this is going to be a problem uh, for you to implement. Um, a lot of people may be familiar with the Toyota production system and this idea of and-on cords, right? So the arrows are pointing to and-on cords. And the idea, right, is that, that you can pull the anon cord and stop the line. And a manager in the Toyota production world uh, will come over and help you debug that problem. Well, they actually uh, started to, did a joint plant with GM and, and Toyota, actually near where I live in San Francisco. Um, and so they used the Toyota management methods, but they had uh, like American managers and, and uh, American workers. And uh, so one of the American workers pulled the anon cord and the manager came over and said, why'd you pull the cord, what are you doing? So what do you think that manager taught that person and everybody that saw that interaction? What, not, exactly. Never stop the line, don't pull the cord. So forgetting to dampen failure where possible, right? So when we talk about chaos engineering, it's not just like, uh, you know, don't watch this talk and say, well, this Paul guy from California said, go to a data center and just unplug cable. So that's what I'm doing. Like, don't do that uh, when you get back to work. I don't want that phone call. Um, all of these organizations dampen failure some way. Whether it's chaos engineering, they plan for it. Netflix famously, you can't opt out of Chaos Monkey. You actually can for the first few months of a new service. Because they want the team to understand what the operational impact of running that service is. So they allow them to opt out while they're still learning about it, right? So you need to, you know, dampen failure when you do these, do these things. Or when you do game days. You have to allow people to, like, uh, you know, stop the exercise if, if they're finding their sort of... Uh, dealing with outside of their capability to deal with it at that point in time. Only reviewing failure. This is, this is a common problem in uh, the tech industry, a lot of industries, but tech especially. We only really review failures. So what's funny, there's a little kind of video. We'll see if this works here. Um, so, you know, this is a plane coming in. You'll notice it's, the runway's over here, so that's kind of odd, but it kind of works out at the end, so that's cool, right? And then, you've, you, so we, you know, push systems a little further. Then you've got this, which is a little, 
Uh, it's, eh, it's okay, sure. Then you've got this, and this pilot gets themselves into a pretty bad situation. You notice the wingtip scrapes right there. And then now we're not even on the runway anymore, so that's cool. Uh, but, you know, they got out of it. They, they went around, and so that's okay. And then you've got this, like sunny day in California, all lined up, everything looks good, until that happens. So my question here is, like, I doubt any of you want to be on any of those planes, but which one got the postmortem? That last one, right? So a lot of times, John Allspaw likes to say, uh, why, why don't we ever postmortem why the site is up? Right? Forgetting about bias, that's a, that's a landmine that we often run into. A um, couple of, of common uh, biases. Oh, by the way, talking about bias, when whoever said, did anyone die in that JFK example? Yeah, that's outcome bias, right? So that's the, the bias that we only look at a particular situation when we know the outcome, right? So that's connected to, uh, to hindsight bias, right? So this idea that with knowledge of the present, our past decisions clearly look bad. And the reason I put kind of the back to the future time machine on this is because, right, it, it's like if we went back in time and you're sitting at your keyboard and you walk up to yourself and you're like, are you sure you really want to drop that table? And you're like, of course I am. Failure is very implausible at this point in my lifetime. Bloop. And then something bad happens, right? So that's, that's hindsight bias. And you can see, by the way, uh, this, this uh, in retros, if you're discussing a lot of the time, why didn't you do X or why didn't you notice Y? Those are called counterfactuals. That's a form of, of this hindsight bias. Correspondence bias, this is the, I'm going to read it, the definition, the undue emphasis on internal characteristics to explain someone else's behavior in a given situation. This is the standard DevOps bias, right? So development, I want change. Operations, I want stability. And I love it. Like, as soon as they have to talk to each other, it's frowny faces. Like, I, I hate those people. I hate those developers. They keep wanting to ship code. And it's like, I hate those ops people. They want to run everything on CentOS 2. Um, so, yeah, that's correspondence bias. So here's the thing. Like, we are awash in a sea of biases. And I'm not trying to say that you can fix them because it's just kind of built into the way um, our brains work. What's funny is this is, I just went to Wikipedia and it was like human bias. And it's like, blah, um, all of these biases. Um, one of my, my favorite two, the IKEA effect. And the IKEA effect is the idea that uh, when it's something we built, we value it more. So if we, we might have this crappy particle board bookshelf, but we spent our Saturday with those Swedish instructions that make no sense. And we built it. And so even if there's this nice mahogany, you know, bookcase over here or whatever, we're going to be like, this is my baby. Um, the other one I like is the rhyme is reason effect. And that's when whatever you say happens to rhyme, people will believe it more of the time. They've done studies on this. They've done studies on this, which is why, by the way, political, spe uh, political slogans tend to rhyme or be alliterative. It's tapping into that bias. Here's a fun example of this. So what you'll hear is a sentence, a spoken sentence, that's been transformed by a computer to sound like gibberish. <laughs> Any idea what they said? No. You can hear it one more time. <laughs> OK, now we'll hear the real sentence. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. The Constitution Center is at the next stop! Does it make sense that time? Yeah, wait, was that the same? It was the exact same sentence that you heard the first time. No way. <laughs> it's the exact same sentence. Your brain is always using prior information to make sense of new information coming in. So once you know what the sentence is, when you go back and hear the distorted version, you can apply that information and it makes sense. The Constitution Center is at the next stop! Isn't that wacky? Um, so the point, again, bias is built into the way that our brains function. So I'm not trying to convince you that you can get around that. What I am trying to say is that when you're doing retros, uh, teams that are really good at, at doing retros and postmortems, they catch bias in each other and are able to say, OK, yeah, that's a, that's a hindsight bias or, or, or what have you. Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, that just means if your incident response process is not great, then you're obviously your uh, incident analysis or postmortem process is not going to be great um, as well. So um, has anyone uh, deprioritizing uh, retrospectives and learning processes is another huge landmine. Has anyone ever had this problem where it's like, OK, well, there's an incident on uh, a Tuesday, and we fix it, uh, and then we schedule the retro for uh, Friday. 
And then Friday rolls around and we're gonna have a Friday afternoon. Friday morning, that Band-Aid fix that we had on Thursday for the issue breaks. So we spend all of Friday fixing it. And then at the end of the day, we're like, we're not doing a retro, we're gonna go have happy hour. Uh, so we, we schedule the, the retro for uh, Monday of, or Tuesday of next week. And then we find out, well, uh, Mary was the main ops engineer who worked that incident. She's on vacation. So uh, we do it to the week after. And then we find, well, the, two, the Monday after that is uh, all hands, so we can't do it. And then it gets pushed to Friday, and that happens to be the company party, right? And suddenly, like this retrospective post-mortem meeting, we're having it four three, four, five weeks after the actual incident, right? Um, I, want, uh, I want to take a couple minutes, and this is where you're going to get in groups. I want you to compare your timelines. Just take a couple minutes to chat with each other. S compare your timelines. We'll do this for 30 more seconds. Okay. Let's come back up front. <laughs> so, whose timelines matched exactly? I see two hands. All right, we're going to review them in front of everyone. No, I'm kidding. Um, but so here's the thing, though, about this that's interesting, right? This incident happened 45 minutes ago, and I told you, I told you I was going to ask you questions about it. Shouldn't all of your timelines be roughly the same? And, and then accurate to what actually happened, right? And so uh, I don't know about you, but I don't tend to have operational incidents that tap me on the shoulder and be like, hey, this is going to be a good one. You should, pay it. you should pay attention. This is going to be really good. So it's important to uh, prioritize those appropriately. Um, this is the Rasmussen Triangle. Uh, I, I want to talk very quickly about it because um, a lot of people like talk about Amazon and Google and Netflix and they're like, uh, well, they're unicorns and they do all this stuff, right? So Rasmussen was a researcher, safety science researcher. He did a lot of work with Three Mile Island. Um, and so the boundaries here are the, uh, on the upper right there, boundary of economic failure. So this is the idea that uh, if we go across that boundary, whatever it is, is too expensive. Like we wouldn't do it because it's just too expensive. On the bottom here, we have the boundary of unacceptable workload. So this is the idea that humans are lazy. And I don't mean that uh, as an insult, it's more that uh, we're hardwired to get the most work out of each gram of sugar that our brain burns. And, and so we just find optimizations. It's a natural way of how humans do work. And then over here, you've got the boundary of uh, acceptable performance and acceptable risk. Any ideas what, that, what happens when you cross over that boundary? Yeah. So uh, there's this idea of pressure gradients in this model. And so things are pushing away from these boundaries. So you've got this idea of cheaper, better, faster pushing away from the economic boundary. You've got uh, people in this system. By the way, this is usually driven by, quote, unquote, the business. You've got uh, maximum work for least effort. So that's the workers are trying to get the most work done, right? So where are we all kind of pushing this system? What direction? Yeah, toward that, that big boom. Um, 
there's a dotted line in the model, and it's interesting, right? Uh, there's this idea uh, of the discretionary space. And so the point that I want to make, it's not that Amazon or Netflix or Google are any better at this than your organization is. It's, uh, at, sorry, have any less incidents than your organization does. But what they're g really good at is exploring this discretionary space. They're really good at uh, noticing when they go near that dotted line and they have to slow down because everybody in that system thought success was actually a failure. So for them, what might be an accident for us is really an incident that none of their customers notice. So that's the major difference there. Finally, uh, final landmine uh, relying on human error or blame. So Anyone use S3? Uh, remember this outage? Uh, yeah, where, so, so this is the postmortem for the outage where the engineer typed the command and I guess it was sbin halt for S3. I don't know what command they typed. Um, but if you read that postmortem, they, they don't use the phrase human error once. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, but this is a list of um, the various things that they learned when they did and went back and looked at the, the retrospective. And one of the big ones, I will tackle the top one. They found, you know, the, the, the engineer typed a command. In the normal course of work, it was a standard command, a standard utility they use all the time, nothing new. Put in, you know, take out of rotation 30 servers instead of I think he meant three or something like that. But they found out all of these other tools that don't check any of those arguments either. So they were able to retrofit those tools to actually put some sanity checking into it. So the point here is if Amazon had just called this human error and just fired that engineer, they would have never learned these critical details about their system, about the system itself, but also how they go about as an organization and as a, a group of people operating that system. It's a huge uh, opportunity for learning there, even though it costs hundreds of millions of dollars. So what now? Well, the key to reframing failure is to stop thinking about incidents as events that went wrong and start thinking about incidents in terms of your team's response. Or another way to put it is develop your incident immune system. Uh, it gets better the more you use it, like our immune system. To make this practical, your operations and infrastructure need to be what I refer to as retrospective ready. If they aren't, it's gonna be really difficult for you to leverage this learning and to get the points out of it that you need to be able to go and talk about it and get that benefit. And finally, the only thing we directly control in complex environments that we operate in is our reactions. That's all I got. And now I have to do a song and dance until Aaron gets back up here.